Quite frankly, you don't mind me having reasonable access to show it to potential buyers. So we make a deal. You're like, hey, no problem. As long as I'm out of here in 90 days, Eric, I don't care what you do. I just want my $500,000 at the end of October. I'm selling the property to you, Eric, at 500,000, but you're saying that you're gonna list it on the MLS for 600,000. I'd like to get it sold quick, but man, I'm not willing to pay that premium, right? I'm giving up $130,000 in my mind to sell quick. I Hi, everybody. Jose Luis Morales. Welcome back to another episode of the Morales Group Show. Today, we have Eric Brewer from Integrity First Home Homebuyers uh, at a cent uh, Central Pennsylvania. And today, he's going to be covering with us the Brewer Method slash Novations. He's going to be explaining to us what is a novation, uh, how does it differ from real estate wholesaling, when it's used, how to pitch it to a seller, basically an all-inclusive video as to what is an ovation. Um, welcome to the show, Eric. How are you? Thanks, man. I'm doing well. I love it. So for our viewers who don't know who Eric Brewer is, who is Eric Brewer and how did you get involved in real estate investing? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I am, uh, first and foremost, I'm a father of six children and a the husband to Sonia Brewer, my lovely wife. Um, I have children ranging from the oldest of 19, the youngest of three months. Um, and a little bit of everything in between. Um, so um, second part of that question, I got in, in, involved in real estate investing back in 2006. Um, shortly after high school, um, I joined the U.S. Army, did my time in the U.S. Army, got out. Um, and uh, sort of stumbled into the automotive industry, um, mm -hmm. took a pretty easy job that with not much responsibility for little pay and um, did that for a couple months and worked my way up through uh, the dealership to eventually being the general sales manager with a few hundred employees. Um, and then after I was in the car business about eight years, just experienced a reasonable amount of burnout, that business um, like many others, mm -hmm. uh, can take its toll on you. The hours, particularly back then, which this was early to late, late nineties, early two thousands was very demanding. Um, I was spending somewhere north of 75 hours a week for the most part at the dealership mm -hmm. and, um, just was burned out ready for a change. Um, that just happened to coincide with my mentor from the car business selling the dealership. He was getting, uh, into real estate and uh, offered an opportunity to join him in that journey. And uh, 2006, February 2006, um, we opened uh, a real estate company here in Pennsylvania. Love it. So okay. that was how I got into to real estate. And w w the company that he opened, was that mainly in like retail type of real estate or investment real estate? No, he, he had started acquiring rental properties um, over the last several years of mm -hmm. um, owning the, the automobile uh, business and, uh, you know, got some experience, had some contacts, learned a little bit about construction and property management. And uh, after exiting uh, the ownership of a, a dealership, a super big dealership is a Toyota franchise with multiple locations, hundreds of employees. And um, that just seemed to be, you know, for him, the logical place to, to progress. And um, I think he actually had saw a, or heard a radio commercial um, during his commute back and forth from um, where we are just out of Harrisburg and where he lived in Baltimore. And uh, it was a radio commercial for a brick and mortar investing school where they teach you basically how to wholesale real estate. So he went to an open house and was like, wow, this is pretty crazy, right? There's a lot of parallels between that and the automotive business, buy low, sell high. And um, he got pretty excited about it, but wanted to do it with someone and knew that he would need additional labor to you know, execute on what he was learning and called me and... I would have followed that guy probably anywhere at that point. He taught me everything I knew. And um, yeah, so we went to this brick and mortar investing school. It's called Investors United in Baltimore County, mm -hmm. about 15 minutes outside of Baltimore, Maryland. They taught us about, you know, direct to seller marketing, um, contract, what they call it, engineering, right? Where you have assignment language in there and stuff like that, um, how to disposition properties and find cash buyers and 
Um, they were one of the, you know, if you think about that back in 2005 and six, they were teaching wholesaling when it wasn't super popular just yet back then. And uh, that's how we got started. Um, we started with buying some homes off the MLS, fixing them up, flipping them. Um, and over the course of the last 17 years, our business has evolved a, a few times. Um, but that's how we got started. It was really, he had dabbled a little bit in some rentals and flipped a house or two. And we just decided to try and 10 X what he had already done. I love it. Cool. So for our viewers that don't know what a novation is, what is a novation as it relates to real estate investing? Yeah. So most people, um, are familiar with wholesale real estate, right? Where you, mm -hmm. you get a property under contract at a wholesale value discounted price, and then you assign your interest in that property to a cash buyer that will fix the house up and, and, and resell it, or maybe they'll fix it up and rent it, or uh, maybe they'll just pay cash for it or get a hard money loan and rent it out or, or whatever, right? But it's the general business of buying at a discount and selling at a discount, whatever margin in between you get to keep. And the mechanism that allows people to wholesale is an assignment, right? It's the assignment document. And there's some paperwork that, that you know, that connects those transactions. Mm -hmm. So, but generally wholesale is, is the assignment of a discounted property to another investor. Mm -hmm. A novation is a replacement of the contract versus an assignment. So why does that matter? It just seems like, uh, you know, a play on words. When you replace or novate a contract, it now becomes a financeable transaction to a retail buyer. So where general wholesale real estate is buying a fixer upper from a distressed seller and selling it to a cash buyer that has the, you know, the, the means to renovate it, you now can change the properties that you acquire as an investor because you have the ability to sell it to a retail buyer using financing at retail prices. Right. So it, it sort of changes the whole wholesale game where you don't have to focus exclusively on discounted properties that need a bunch of work that are owned by distressed sellers. Um, it moves the target a little bit where anytime you can acquire a property below full retail value, you have the ability now to novate it and exit it at full retail value using the MLS. Right. Um, and as long as there's margin there after commissions. Um, you still don't have to close on it. You don't have to renovate it. So it's a wholesale style transaction, but exiting at retail values. I love it. And it also uh, helps people be able to, like investors capitalize on more opportunities basically, because before the novation, I almost feel like they're leaving all these extra deals that they weren't really able to do much with on the table. And now with this, it allows them to capitalize on those. So what does a novation agreement look like? What are some of the terms in a, in an agreement? Um, yeah, it's a very good point. So generally to your, your first point, um, and, and let's say out of a hundred net leads that a normal investor gets that does marketing, only 10% of those generally are a really good fit for a wholesale offer. 50% of your leads generally are not able to be converted, right? Like for one reason or another, they're two years away from selling. They want an unrealistic sale price. Um, there's multiple decision makers. They're not on the same page, whatever, right? It's, it's, there's like zero chance of those people selling anytime soon. The balance of 40% of uh, most people's leads are a really good fit for innovation. There's like a moderate amount of, of motivation. They'd like to get a deal done sooner than later. The house is in pretty good shape which makes it appealing to a retail buyer that's going to live in it. And they're willing to allow a little bit of um, margin in there, right? But they're not going to sell it at, at a deep discount, but they're willing to, to move a little bit on price. So 40% generally of, of active investors that are doing marketing, 40% of their leads are monetizable by way of novation. And they have zero success converting them to a wholesale deal because the people just aren't distressed. The how doesn't need a bunch of work. And they're just not willing to sell it for pennies on the dollar. Um, so to, to your point, yeah, it, it's a, I mean, there's actually four times more innovation opportunities in a normal investor's marketing funnel than there is wholesale. Um, I'm sorry, what was the second part of your question? The second part was just like, what are the, some of the, the terms paperwork. on an innovation agreement? Yeah. Like yeah, so um, 
the first thing you have to do just in a contract, so you really just have to add, uh, to give yourself the legal ability to novate, you only have to add one layer or one line of, of, of wording. It just says buyer reserves the right to novate property without formal notice to seller. Very similar to most assignment language. We're just pulling out the word assignment and plugging in novation. Now that doesn't set the proper expectations with the seller. That's not giving you not permission enough. to take it. To, that just gives you literally just the legal ability, right? Yeah. Um, the second part is um, what what we've been doing, and again, I've I've really started doing these heavy at about two thousand nine, and um, what we've created is a ton of paperwork uh, where we're just extremely transparent and forthcoming with expectations with sellers. Uh, because the best way to disposition and ovation is through the MLS. You really have to have some matter of fact conversation with a seller before you take it to the open market. And they see it on Zillow, Realtor.com, Redfin. There's a sign out front. There's a guy with a Remax sticker on the side of his car pulling up to show their house. They're like, what the heck's going on? I thought you were buying it for cash as is. This this, this isn't what we agreed upon, right? So mm -hmm. legally, you just have to have one line of language. The second piece that, that puts a, a novation deal together is, is what we use as a novation addendum. So basically, remember, novate means replace. So I'll, I'll walk you through a deal, right? Let's say Jose and I agree on half a million dollars for his house in California. I fully mm -hmm. disclose to you that the only way I can make that deal work for me as an investor is if you give me permission um, to take it to the open market. And quite frankly, you don't mind me having reasonable access to show it to potential buyers. So we make a deal. You're like, hey, no problem. As long as I'm out of here in 90 days, Eric, I don't care what you do. I just want my $500,000 at the end of October. Okay, no problem. Mm -hmm. The next thing I have to do is take that property and legally get it listed in, in the local multiple list service, right? So each state will have a slightly different process for that. Um, California, where you are, might be a little bit more litigious and restrictive than other states. In Pennsylvania, and I've taught this to students all across the country, but in Pennsylvania, um, we have the seller execute the actual listing agreement. Um, or on occasion, some of them will give us a limited power of attorney and go, dude, I don't want to mess with all that paperwork. Here's a limited POA. You, you, can, exer you can execute all those documents. I don't want to be part of all that stuff. Just make this easy for me, right? So then we get it listed in the MLS. Now a buyer's offer comes in. So let's switch hats for a second and say, Jose's representing a buyer that makes an offer on this property, right? And they're using conventional Fannie Mae financing. Mm -hmm. Well, the contract is written between the actual owner and the end buyer. Well, that contract's not enforceable yet because the owner has a contract to sell it to Eric, right? You can't have two enforceable contracts in play at one time. So the only way I can get this enforceable end buyer contract in play is I have to release my contract. This is where people get nervous and go, hold on, I'm releasing my contract. How am I going to get paid? Well, we've created a novation addendum that says, okay, Mr. Owner, I'm releasing you of this contract conditional upon this other contract performing. And if and when that contract goes to settlement, I get the difference in proceeds between our original contract price and this new contract price. And I also absorb all of this commission, this, this, these inspections, all of these disclosures, I absorb all of the, the, the obligations that are different on this new contract, right, from, from what you and I agreed mm -hmm. on. And any net proceeds that shake out as a result of that, I get to keep as well. Does that make sense? So, so then I novate the agreement, which is just code for replace it. I conditionally attach my novation addendum that says, hey, when this deal gets to settlement, I basically have a cloud on title that ensures I'm being paid. And that's in caveman terms, that's 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 how novation deals get done. Um, you, you get a contract, you have equitable interest. That equitable interest gives you the, the, the ability to market the property for sale. Once a suitable third-party buyer comes along, you replace your original purchase contract with the new A to C contract. And then we've created some addendums and disclosures in between that ensure that you get paid as the investor. Uh -huh. and, and now it's a financeable transaction because it's going from the deeded owner to a third party buyer with no assignment language in between that would normally create a title issue or a lending issue. Um, so that that's that's effectively the mechanics of how innovation gets done. I love it. And then um, 
as it relates to the owner, whenever they sign the listing agreement, do they ever question it? Meaning like, okay, like I, I'm selling the property to you, Eric, at 500,000, but you're saying that you're going to list it on the MLS for 600,000. Yeah. Like, is there ever any concerns there? And if so, how are those concerns addressed? Yeah. So two things. One, if it comes up at the listing agreement, it means we probably didn't do a good enough job framing the conversation initially when we made the agreement, right? So one critical piece of this is we don't just go in and offer $500,000. Generally, if we started with a wholesale cash, very quick, no access, no listing, none of that, um, we probably started at 370, right? And they said no. And you said, well, is there anything about those terms you may be flexible on? And most people will say at that point that time's not as important as money, right? Convenience might not be as important as, that's effectively what they're saying. They're saying, Jose, I, you know, I wanted to sell it quick, man, but I'm not willing to let it go for 370, mm -hmm. right? And you go, well, yeah, but I can close quick. And they say, what? Yeah, but I mean, I don't need to, I'm not in any hurry. Like I like to get it sold quick, but and I'm not willing to pay that premium, right? I'm giving up $130,000 in my mind to sell quick. I, I mean, three weeks is cool, but as long as we're out of here in three months, I'd be fine, right? So, and there's generally, you know, as an investor, there's time and money, right? Like, and each of those will adjust. If someone wants to sell a house really quick and they call you as a list agent, you're going to generally advise them to price it lower because it'll, it'll, it'll incentivize quick action, right? So when a seller says, I, I can give you more time. That generally means that the investor can give them more money. Fair enough. Got it. Yeah. So Fair time enough. is money, right? That saying has been around for a hundred years. So we start at 370 with our, our wholesale cash offer. And then as the seller sort of responds to that, in my experience, it generally flushes out two things for them. They say, hey, I'm not in any hurry. I'm not going to give it away. So mm -hmm. then effectively what we do is we go, Hey, Jose, I've tried to do a really good job of listening to you today. And it sounds like, when you say you're not in a rush, that, that maybe three weeks isn't important. Um, you've mentioned that three months would be fine. They're like, yeah, 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 three months. I mean, as long as I can get out of here in time to get to my new job by, you know, um, Q2, I, I'm fine. I just, I don't want to wait six months, right? And that's, that's why I was a little worried about maybe listing it and cleaning it out and having mm -hmm. two mortgages and all that stuff. Um, and, you know, oftentimes when people contact us initially, they don't want us to have any access. Like they don't want to be disturbed. Like we can't even get in here to get like a meter reading off the, for the water company. Right. But it sounds like that's not too big of a deal to you. And they're like, well, no, I mean, it's going to be vacant by the end of the month. And again, I just want to have it sold before I have to make a third mortgage payment. I mean, I don't really care if you guys, you can come and go as much as you please. Just make, don't let the dog out. Right. <laughs> or, or, or whatever it is. So now they've indicated that they're flexible on the two most important things you need to sell innovation is reasonable access and permission to take it to the open market. So if the seller reveals to you during negotiations that those two things are reasonable compromises, you now have what you need to make an innovation deal. So even now, as I'm talking to you and we're role playing it, right, I'm going to say like, Jose, the only way I could make this work is if you were willing to give me reasonable access and they're going to go, well, what's that mean? Well, you know, we really like to get this out in front of the, the maximum amount of possible buyers that might buy it as is. Maybe they want a little bit of work or maybe someone would like to buy it from me completely fixed up after you and I settle up. And some people want to pick out kitchen cabinets and shutter colors, but I can't, I, I don't know that until I can get the property out in front of them. Um, and then there's other people that don't want to buy it, but maybe they just want to do a home inspection and they might want me to fix a couple of safety items. The only way for me to know which one of those buyers is the best buyer for me is if I can get it on the open market and bring all of those people here and then sift through all of those showings and try and find one or two people that are willing to work with me on a reasonable price. Mm -hmm. So if you gave me the ability to take it to the open market, I would feel much more comfortable coming way up in price from 370 to meet you at that 500. If you would be willing to, to be a little flexible in those two things with me, I feel pretty good about maybe being able to get you up super close or maybe all the way to that 500 you mentioned. But I could be getting a little ahead of myself. I'm, not every house fits this, right? Not every house is a great fit for that. And I don't even know if anything like that would interest you. Of course, they're going to say, well, no. <laughs> yeah, right. So if we're having that conversation, by the time I get to the listing agreement and I'm listing it for 600,000, I've already addressed it, right? So like, 
we're really big in what I teach and what we practice inside of our organization is I'm going to push it towards a no instead of like getting a, a mediocre yes, a signed agreement, and then literally every part of the transaction is a nightmare because we didn't do a good job disclosing to the seller up front what our intentions were. People will allow you, and I do some training and coaching with real estate agents, and one of the things um, they're constantly harping about is how their commissions are getting compressed. And I think it's because too often as real estate agents, we don't share enough of the behind the scenes work that you do to get a deal to settlement, right? It's like, there's an appraisal issue. Don't call the seller. No, call the seller and tell them there's an issue. And thank goodness they have someone like you on their side that's got a plan to work yeah. through that to get it resolved. And then what happens is at the end, the seller gets to settlement. In their eyes, the, the deal went off without a hitch. And now Jose's getting this big $28,000 commission check. And in their eyes, you didn't do any work. When meanwhile, behind the scenes, you were pulling your hair out, staying up till two in the morning, trying to figure out how to get comps over to the appraiser to close a $200,000 appraisal gap, arguing with the buyer's agent three days a week about repairs that they wanted done that weren't realistic for them to ask your seller. And you did all of this work and got to settlement and the seller doesn't know anything about it. So the perception of the value of a real estate agent in my eyes has unfairly got compressed but it's up to the agent to convey more of sort of the, the, what the, the hazards the that come up. Yeah. Hey, don't want you to worry, but it's super important that I stay transparent with you throughout the organization. You know, this, this transaction, we have a little bit of a hurdle. Great news is I have a plan. Here's my plan. I think by Tuesday at four o'clock, I'll have it resolved. Okay. If I call you with an update, once I have more information, like you can't, because then what happens is sometimes those things don't get resolved. And then three days before mm -hmm. settlement, you're breaking bad news. And now a bad situation has only got worse. So with that being said, um, you know, it's really important for us to be super transparent up front and people will allow you to make money if they can see a fair trade for convenience and effort based on the money that they're making. Does that make in, sense? In like it, it does. What I was going to ask you in the novation agreement, you're also uh, telling them that if any repairs come up or anything comes up, then you're basically making yourself responsible for that as well Correct. too, right? Right. And yeah. Then, so like if, if you look, they want to sell it as is, right? Like you, you, I'm sure you get sellers all the time that want to sell it as is and the property's actually in good shape, mm -hmm. right? All well, what does time. a buyer yeah. think when you see a property listed as is? What What is their immediate knee jerk reaction when a property's listed as is? What does a buyer think? There's a problem. There's yeah. hidden issues, right? Like there's something wrong with the house. So when a seller says as is, they mean convenience. But what a buyer hears is there's a money pit on the other side of this deal that I'm going to avoid or I'm going to lowball the snot out of. So a lot mm -hmm. of times the way that we make our money is simply offering the seller an as is transaction. And we're acting as an insurance policy between the seller and the buyer that the seller has an uninterrupted amount of net proceeds and the buyer has the security of knowing that they can get an appraisal especially FHA, right? Like FHA and VA, they have condition requirements that come along with the appraisal that most sellers want to avoid. I'm perfectly comfortable in it. I've sold 2,500 homes to FHA buyers. I know FHA, VA condition requirements like the back of my hand. So like a seller might go, no, 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 no. I don't want to sell my house to an FHA buyer. I've heard nightmares about repairs. I'm looking at the house and going, there's maybe $1,800 worth of FHA repairs here. I'll give you $500. I'm going to sell at FHA through Innovation for $600. I'll pay out a $30,000 commission and $2,000 worth of FHA repairs, and I'm going to net fifty grand. The seller got what they wanted. I'm, I'm bridging the gap and bringing inventory to conventional buyers that want inspections and appraisals that otherwise wouldn't be available. And I'm basically acting as an insurance policy to handle repairs, appraisal deficiencies, all of that and protecting the seller from it. Do they do the, does the seller ever ask you like up front, like um, what are you going to list the property for? Or what are you going to put it on the open market? And do they ever you know, ask like, why don't I just put it on the open market instead? Is that ever a question? Um, so no, not very often, but I think that's because of the way our sales process works. If, if you make your presentation to a seller about ARV renovation, profit and net proceeds, you're guiding the conversation in a logical direction where they're making a mathematical decision about the value of, of what you offer. 
the way that we run our operation is we are 100% like needs focused and money only becomes important to people if you don't bring anything else to the table. So the majority of sellers that we do business with, right, which are, it's not the person seeking generally the exactly. highest amount of money out of their property. They, they have some circumstances in their life that has, has created a need for discretion and convenience and certainty that they attach a higher value to than the conventional seller. I love so it. So the way that we run, knowing that, we focus on discretion, convenience, and speed not ARV minus reno, I got to make money as an investor, right? Um, those conversations typically stall out very quickly because you're, it's, it's a logical explanation of, of your, 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 and frankly, most people argue about it. They think their house fixed up is worth way more than, than, than I do. They never think that their house needs as much work as I think it does. And they always think we're making way too much money. Right. Like you're going to make more than 40. And it's like, well, no, right. Here's the calculation. Show me where I'm making for Like I, I can't just miraculously make a hundred thousand dollar profit on a hundred and fifty house. It just the math doesn't, doesn't. work. Yeah. So we just focus all of our. So. But yeah, it comes up occasionally. And I just I'm always a big fan of just being completely transparent and honest. It's like, Jose, I hope I make 40. But I tell you what, if I get lucky, I might make 70. Does that make you uncomfortable as long as you get your 500? And most people, the right customer will go, well, no, I was just curious. Well, let me ask you a question. What if what if it sells for 650? Are you going to have second thoughts about selling it to me for 500? Like, I'd rather have that conversation now than down the road. Um, mm -hmm. And you'll find that most people are very appreciative of that transparency. And the answer more often than not is, no, no, no. You know, I, I really want to get out of here. And as long as I get my 500, I don't care what you do. I, I hope you make $300,000. Now, there's been instances where we literally made six figures on a novation deal, did absolutely no work. The inspection came back clean and the people were like, eh. Um, and each time we just went back and reiterated the conversations we had up front. We revisited all of the paperwork that we use on these transactions to make sure that there's full disclosure. Um, and I could probably count on one hand in the last 10 years where we had to renegotiate those deals. And I gave them two to $15,000 more money and that solved the problem, right? They, they couldn't say you weren't honest with me. They couldn't say we didn't talk about it. They just had some seller's remorse. And fortunately enough, in each of those transactions, we had generated enough equity that we didn't mind sharing it with the seller. And then they were ecstatic. I love it. Good. Now, in novation type of properties, do you guys ever fix them up before putting them on the marketplace? Is that a typical part of the novation process? Or you know, it, do you guys usually try to... Uh, eliminate that and only do repairs if it means qualifying for the loan. Yeah, I, I would say we seldom, if ever, do any repairs up front. Um, it just creates, you know, you spend, say, $10,000. Now you've paid money on a house you don't own. Um, and there's ways that, 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 you know, we have to protect your interest through like a mechanics lien or a recorded notice of interest that you can protect yourself. But anytime you lose a deal, it's bad layer $10,000 on top of that, that you have invested, it, it, it just makes, makes it um, worse. situations worse. And what I found is if we literally focus on those 40% of leads that we get where the house doesn't really need any work and there's enough margin between what I can get the seller to agree to versus what a retail buyer will pay, I, I we reserve the right and have the luxury of turning away the other transactions. Because um, anytime you do a clean out, painting one room, <laughs> Like now it, it changes a little bit of your disclosures, right? Because now you've had a contractor in there, you've done work to the property, you have a higher level of responsibility to disclose to the seller. It changes a little bit of the buyer's expectations. Uh, anytime they see evidence of investor activity, for some reason, buyers just feel way more comfortable asking for big discounts, uh, asking for tons of repairs because they're not buying from what looks like a homeowner, they're buying from an investor. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm just generally not a big fan of fixing up homes. I like to focus on uh, the houses that are in pretty good shape that will pass without a lot of um, money and aggravation, a home inspection, and will pass through FHA, VA condition requirements. And, and we just, we try and be really, really good at that. And then if it needs renovation, I'd rather just buy it for wholesale, close on it, fix it up and sell it. Like that's the two buckets that we put our inventory in. Uh, now, I can tell you, 
from like 2018 to like the end of 2022, everything sold regardless of condition for full asking price. We are seeing now that like buyers are becoming a little bit more discerning that we may um, stay what we call stage a property that's lived in is like decluttering. We call it decluttering internally. I wouldn't say that to the seller because it comes across a little offensive. We'd say, Jose, in order to make this deal work, um, we'd like to get you enrolled in our staging service. It's 100% free to you. We would generally have someone come by and sort of straighten up and even help with maybe moving some of your items into the garage so it's easier for you when the moving day comes. Is that something that would be um, possible? And they'll go, yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's super helpful because I wanted to get rid of some stuff anyway. So we'll go in and declutter and straighten up. Um, but that's, you know, 500, 1,000, 2,000 bucks up front Very after minimal. we've gotten clean title back and we know that it's a solid deal that's going to go to settlement. So we have been doing more of that lately, but we're not painting, we're not doing carpeting, we're not doing roofs or furnaces. Um, if that stuff is really something that should be done, we'll put it, we'll bake it into the price and then we'll put right in the comments, hey, $10,000 credit for paint and carpet at settlement, right? $20,000 dollar credit for a brand new roof with an acceptable offer. We, we really use the credits versus the actual renovations. And in most areas, inventory is still at an all-time low. People are way more receptive to that now than they were in, say, 2012 to 2015. I love it. What about um, value? Like, I know on wholesale deals, people usually buy at 65, 60 cents on the dollar, 70 cents on the dollar how, what is a typical rule of thumb for novations as yeah. to where you like to be and the most that you can go on, on ARV? Yeah. So I'll, I'll unpack that a little bit. The first term that you want to get comfortable with in novations is CCRV, current condition retail value, right? ARV assumes that there's after repairs. After repair. We're not doing any repairs here. So, and, and then again, we, we've gotten away from using the as is language in here because it's intimidating to a potential buyer and alienates um, the, the most attractive buyer population out there, which is owner occupied conventional financing. So, con current condition retail value in a market where the median sale price is, say, 275 or higher. We've, we've been able to see where you can pay up to 85% of CCRV and still make north of a $20,000 profit. I love it. I love it. Okay. And then um, whenever you open up escrow uh, on a novation, are you putting the earnest money deposit in, in a deal? And does yeah. that typically stay in until it closes? Or do you get that Correct. refunded at the time where the new buyer comes in? Or how does that work? So most of our transactions, um, we're doing minimal earnest money. Now, every once in a while, you'll get a seller that pushes back and wants 10%, five grand, a big, but generally we're given maybe $500 deposits. Um, and we, we don't really expect it to be released until the deal goes to settlement. If you had 40 of these tied up at 10 grand a piece, I guess when you got the replacement buyer, you could have them replace your earnest money. Um, but we don't really come across that too much. We might have 20 of these and play at any given time. And again, sometimes we're not even doing any earnest money. Um, if, it's really up to the seller's discretion, right? If they'll push back on it, um, we have some word tracks and explanations about like that earnest money is only good if we default. And the way that the contracts are written is we have due diligence, assignment language, innovation language that the only way we could default is if we literally just didn't communicate and show up the day of settlement without any formal notice. Um, in that case, you know, getting a 500 or a thousand bucks isn't going to make that situation any better. Um, but yeah, you could have in your novations, if you're giving large deposits, like in California, if you're doing this on million dollar homes, you have a more discerning seller. Maybe it's like, Hey man, I, I'm okay with all this, but I want a 25 grand deposit. You could do that. And then the instant you novate it, you could say, Hey, I've terminated this contract. I'm replacing it with a new one. I get my 25 K back and I've replaced it with 25 grand from the end buyer. That's how I would structure that in an atmosphere or a market more like what you see in California, where the dollar amount um, is much higher and the sellers, you know, demanding a, a, a substantial earnest deposit. Got it. And then if that buyer is unable to perform on that deal, the the new buyer, your contract goes back into place if that buyer cancels, basically, at least according Correct. to the new. Yeah. So if that deal board. dies, you don't lose your position in the contract. We have that in the. Novation addendum, where if that A to C deal, that end buyer deal 
is unable to perform, you automatically step in. Your, your now, contract is right back in play. Now, whenever you're making offers to the owners, um, do you have a contingency period typically? Or yes. is it, uh, and how long is that contingency uh, period typically? So, uh, there, so this moves, right, based on a, a balanced agreement that's fair to both parties. There's a short due diligence period that's more fair to the seller. And then there's really long due diligence periods that's out of balance to, to, to the investor's discretion, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm a hundred percent concerned about what's best for the investor, I'm going to, I'm going to structure it with a due diligence period that matches my settlement date. So the settlement date is 90 days out and I have a due diligence um, contingency in there that takes me right up to the settlement date, which basically says, depending on how you structure your due diligence period, that you effectively could back out the day of closing. Um, we don't really like to do that. Again, we're, we're big on transparency. So as you, the closer you get to 85% of CCRV, the more risk there is for you or another buyer not being able to perform. The lower you buy, right? Like if, if, if Jose, if someone brought yeah. you a, a house that you knew was going to sell in the MLS today for six ninety five, and they said, you got to give me five fifty, and I want to close in 90 days, you can write that contract with a short due no, diligence period. Yeah, because you have a, a very, so the better you get at forecasting CCRV, you can start to shorten your due diligence periods, which will give you um, more credibility with the seller. You'll get less pushback from attorneys that review the contracts. And ultimately, you're not setting yourself up for failure where you got a contract, you got a 90 day due diligence. And on day 89, you're calling the seller to let them know you can't perform. And now you have an upset customer, right? They're screaming and yelling. You've not done a very good job of managing expectations. So I know that's not a straightforward answer, but it's it's it should be somewhere. Hopefully you get your system so dialed in that you can operate with like 14 day due diligence, right? Which is relatively short. Um, if you're not doing a really good job of forecasting and, and identifying what a solid CCRV is, you should probably protect yourself and bake in a longer due diligence all the way out to the settlement date. And then somewhere in between is a balance where it might be 30 days due diligence, 90 days to perform. And inside of that 30 days, you've gathered enough information to say, you know what? I feel really confident this is going to go to settlement. I'm removing the due diligence period and we'll see you in 60 days. I love it. What about uh, commissions uh, for real estate agents? Are you guys listing the properties yourself? Or are you going yeah. on a discounted flat fee type of service? Is it uh, a particular agent that you guys work out these types of deals? Uh, yeah, so and, that's a, and also what's a commission, a fair commission to pay as gotcha. well too in these types of situations. Um, so I'm a I'm a big believer in in local agent representation. Um, most investors um, have a innate tendency to be cheap, and they gravitate towards flat fee. And I'm going to share in my experience what might be a little dirty secret about flat fee as a buyer's agent in a balanced market. I know for certain that a buyer's agent is hesitant to show and sell a property listed by a flat fee service. Why? Oftentimes they're familiar that the owner of that property chose a flat fee listing service because they're cheap. Oftentimes communication on flat fee listing services goes direct to sellers. So now you got a, a licensed seasoned real estate professional like Jose talking to a completely uneducated seller. That's emotional, right? That's a horrible transaction. That's, that's doomed. And I, and most buyer's agents will, they won't even show their, their, their buyers that property. Mm -hmm. uh, much like when you see new builder activity slows down, right? And builders were, were paying like half of a percent buyer's agent commission. And then as the market comes back, what do they start to do? Right? It gets harder to sell new construction. Uh, new, new builders start offering incentives to buyers, elevated commissions to buyer's agents. So, and then it's anytime you use a buyer or a flat fee listing service, it puts all the dispo responsibility back onto your team as an investor. So I'm a big mm -hmm. fan of finding a local agent with local experience and knowledge. They have access and influence over appraisers, local lenders. Um, they have probably a, a great relationship with a local title company that'll help get your deal closed. And then we've successfully negotiated um, for anybody that we give volume to, I would say volume that's, that's north of a you know, million dollars a month. Um, I have agents lined up to list my stuff for one to one and a half percent. We handle all of the TC. We cover professional pictures. So they're literally just getting one to one and a half percent to get it listed, negotiate on my behalf, 
um, and then support TC to get it sold. So our, our normal Novation total commissions, two and a half percent to a buyer's agent, one and a half percent max to a list agent for a total of four percent. I love it. I love it. Now, uh, can real estate agents do Novations themselves as well, too? And yeah. if so, how do they protect themselves so that they're doing it the right way? You've done a great job of preparing. These are remarkable questions, by the way. Um, yes, they can, right? Like you, you can you can invest in real estate as a as as a, a real estate agent. And Novation is just another way of investing. Two things that I would tell you need to do: disclose, disclose, disclose. You go to a seller and you're engaging in. Um, I'm a investor. You're a seller. Activity. You should disclose right up front that you're an agent. We have a simple mm -hmm. one page document we use with all of our people who are licensed. Um, that act as acquisitions agent says, Hey, I'm a licensed professional. I do this for a living today. I'm here operating in the capacity of a buyer. I'm not here operating in the capacity of an agent charging you a commission for advice. That's number one. Number two, you either act as the acquisitions person who buys the property or the list agent that listed. I do not like the optics of you being both. So for example, if Jose goes, hey, I'm going to start doing these novations and you get leads from seller and you go out and make an offer and they go, that's fine, Jose, I'll sell it to you for $500,000. And as long as you close in six months, you can have access. Jose, you should take that now to another agent inside of your brokerage or your team and have them list the property for you. Otherwise, again, it's not illegal, but otherwise you met with a seller, you bought their property at a discount. You didn't list it. You didn't improve it. You didn't renovate it. You listed it while they were still the deeded owner and sold it for a forty to $100,000 profit. You are setting yourself up for people to speculate that you're not operating ethically. Um, and the problem with that is right or wrong, you have to prove that you're doing something right, not the opposite. So it's going to take time and attention and energy away from you. Separate the two. If you're a licensed agent, either be the guy that buys it or the guys that the guy that sells it. Don't be both. Do do you does this ever happen? And this may be in my head, where maybe like a buyer's agent goes to show the property, and then for whatever reason, them and the seller get in a conversation, yeah. and now that agent is saying, "Oh, well, that, what do you mean they have it tied up at five hundred thousand, but they're listing it at six hundred fifty? Does that ever happen where a buyer's agent's almost like?" sabotaging the the sale at all or is that um in i mean yeah so again any any issue you have at the middle or the end of a deal really stems from improper disclosure and expectations on the front mm -hmm. so i'll just preface that by saying that right so if if you've done a good job of setting expectations and it's not unusual for a seller to hang out at a showing or come home early or leave late and there's normal conversation that comes up once a buyer, it's it's really torturous interference at that point, right? If a buyer's agent yeah. allows that conversation to move toward, why would they do that? So that they could potentially get a better deal for their buyer. But you can't have that type of dialogue with a seller, whether it's a novation or deal or not, right? Like, you know, mm -hmm. a buyer's agent can't really have pricing, um, any real monetary conversation with someone that's represented by another agent. That that should not be happening. Um, but yeah, it'll it'll pop up here and there. You'll just have to probably do maybe some damage control, um, you know, whether it's talking the buyer's agent off the cliff because they don't understand it. But I would tell you today that like that's way more normal today than it was 15 years ago. Like people assigning deals, wholesaling deals, novating deals. That's way more common today than it was 15 years ago. I'd be surprised if a buyer's agent would even get caught up in saying, what do you mean they have it tied up for five and they're trying to sell? I mean, I think they would go, oh yeah, that makes sense. Good for them. It sounds like they got a good deal. And Mr. Seller, it seems like you're happy. I wish you guys the best of luck. I know that's probably wishful thinking, but um, yeah, it'll happen. Um, again, the better job you do of setting expectations with your seller. Um, and then we, we communicate with our sellers every week, right? So if something like that comes up, if they're a little disturbed by it, we're having some dialogue with them every single week where we're able to, you know, overcome whatever objections or, um, you know, diffuse whatever situation's going on. And then from a buyer's agent perspective, like most buyer's agents that are experienced know that they need to limit their conversation to just polite, you know, um, professional dialogue. They shouldn't really be talking about any aspects of the deal with a seller, but it will happen. You just, you'll have to, you know, diffuse it when it, when it takes place, but it, it shouldn't really happen. 
Got it. Any uh, final uh, tips uh, that you think people should know as it relates to novations? Uh, any uh, final thoughts that would potentially help our viewers? Yeah, I think um, one of the things I've noticed about wholesale real estate is that it's it's very much like the wild, wild west. There's like no real legislation. There's really no governance. There's you, you fortunately or unfortunately, depending who you talk to as a wholesaler, you can go out there and just start hacking away. And whatever you do wrong, probably be forgiven. Whatever you do right, you'll be compensated. When you're novating properties and you're involving licensed brokers, buyers agents, FHA lenders, which by FHA, right, it's a government backed entity program. Mm -hmm. You 100% cannot wing it with novations. Don't grab a couple pieces of paper off the internet and go out and go, I'm going to see how it works out. Um, I would strongly encourage you not to wing it, right? If you're a wholesaler, if you expended with wholesale, improper documentation, um, you know, not properly disclosing to a seller. You are setting yourself up for the potential for, you know, I think really big issues if you just go out and start listing stuff in the multiple list and making like I've had people that call me and go, yeah, man, I saw you on Instagram. Um, seems like you're the guy to go to. Like, I got this deal and I'm getting a bunch of trouble from the t title company and the lender. Can you help me out? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll try and do my best. And I'll ask like two fundamental questions like who signed the listing agreement? Well, we did. We had POA. On behalf of who? We're me, the investor. But you're not the seller. You, dude. That's so they got a contract between Integrity First Home Buyers and a third party buyer, and then the the HUD shows the deeded owner. Like, dude, you got a mess on your hands, right? And we, we end up going unpacking it. Most situations, when you have a willing buyer and a willing seller, you know, even yeah. when problems pop up, you can still get it resolved. Um, but it's very messy and, and, and I, I just I don't like um, messy deals and especially when you're dealing with people's livelihoods and then a heavily regulated industry like re retail real estate. It is not the wild, wild west. Um, it's heavily regulated and you need to make sure that you're you got the right paperwork, the right disclosures. Um, you're verbally disclosing correctly and you're setting proper expectations. So my my advice would be. Um, take massive action, but do not under any circumstances wing it. I love it. Now, if people wanted to learn from you, maybe wanted to learn how to do it the right way, wanted uh, to get some paperwork from you, uh, do you offer coaching on this? And also, if you do, what is the best way for people to get in contact with you? We do. Um, just like everything else, there's the free method and then there's the paid method. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram. Um, I literally... I put out probably two or three videos a day walking people through how to get started with novations, how to get better at them, um, all the way through to how to get paid um, and make the most out of the transaction. Um, some of those people that follow me for a period of time um, want to speed up that process. Um, I host uh, weekly webinars. Um, the, the, the link to that webinar is right in my bio. You can come to a webinar. They're typically 90 minutes to two hours where I'm diving into um, case studies that I've closed on that previous week. So I go through real deals that I'm doing on a weekly basis. Uh, most cases it's five to six novation deals a week that I'm doing. Um, and then if they choose that, like, Hey, you know, I really want to do this. I want to speed up that, that learning process. We have a coaching program um, where we give them all of the documents plus 12 weeks of live training with me and my team. Um, and if they want to bypass all that other crap and go right to the coaching program, they can find that at brewermethod.com. I love it. Well, I want to say thank you, Eric, for taking the time to come on the show. I know that your time is valuable. You're one of the people that I respect very heavily in this industry, and I'm glad that we were able to share all about novations uh, to all of the viewers out there. For our viewers out there, thank you as well for taking the time to come on. Uh, in today's episode, we uh, covered the Novation Method with Eric Brewer. If you've enjoyed this episode, make sure to hit that subscribe button. If you feel that this episode will be helpful to somebody, make sure to hit that share button. Uh, Eric, thank you so much again. And to our viewers, until next time.